Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. What was so special about May 17th? Nothing special. It wasn't my wife's birthday or our anniversary or even the first day we met. It was an ordinary day and ordinary Tuesday and that's why I chose it. My name is Keith and my marriage to Lisa after 12 years has started to become a little stale or should I say predictable. It's not that I didn't love her, she and the children were the most important things in my life. However, that little sparkle that usually appeared in her eyes when I mentioned making love seemed to be gone lately. So, being the hopeless romantic that I am, I decided to give her an evening she would never forget. Monday morning at work, I pulled out the big guns, Katie, Cheryl, and Karen, three of the hottest single women at work. Okay, ladies, if you could write the script for the most romantic night of your life, what would it be? I asked them. Around midnight, they all started zipping off to Paris, making love in a gondola in Venice, or watching the sunset from a hot tub over the Swiss Alps. Easy, girls, I told them. I'm more thinking about a romantic night at home or in one of the hotels in the city center, something that won't break my bank account. By midday, they were back with a list of ideas now in my price range. I thanked them, treated them to lunch, and began making plans. They seemed almost as excited as I was, jumping up and down, telling me that I better not fail because now they had a bet on how my evening would end. The first thing I did was take Wednesday afternoon off so I could get everything done before she returned. I usually got home around 6 o'clock, but Lisa was always home by half past 3 to meet the kids as they got off the school bus. On Tuesday night, I told Lisa that my parents wanted to take the kids to dinner and a show on Wednesday, so they probably wouldn't get home until 8 o'clock in the evening. The kids were even more excited when I told them that I had a surprise for their mom and that they would actually spend the night with their grandparents, who always spoiled them terribly. I left work around 11.30 on Wednesday with my trusty list in hand. Let's see, free time, children with mothers, then a trip to the store. Let's see, a sweet card, tons of good chocolate, and her favorite wine. The girls gave me a complete list of everything that needed to be done, down to the lighting and music to set the mood. The florist looked at me strangely when I asked her for two pounds of pink petals, that is until I told her what I was going to do with them. You must love your wife very much if you went to all this trouble for her, she said as I left with the red rose petals in my hand. I finally booked a table for eight at Lisa's favorite steakhouse. I figured we'd need some food by eight, and if we decided to cancel dinner, I'd make sure we had steaks in the fridge to grill on the patio. Finally, everything began to come together. I returned home, hid the car behind the house, and brought everything into the kitchen. Let's see, 2.30. That gives me an hour to get everything ready, I told myself. Over the next hour, I froze the wine in the freezer, made a huge heart on the bed with rose petals, and using chocolate chips, wrote the words, I love you, in the center. I filled the garden tub with water and sprinkled the remaining rose petals on top of the bubbling water. On my side of the bed, I placed the wine in an ice bucket, and on her nightstand, I placed a card next to the reading light. I dimmed the overhead light, opened a bottle of wine, and poured two glasses. I placed our portable CD player on the dresser and decided that I would turn it on after she entered the bedroom. The last thing I did was take a shower, shave, and strip naked. At exactly 3.25, I heard her car pull up. I was more than ready. I closed the bedroom door, stood at the foot of the bed naked, holding two glasses of wine, and waited for her to come upstairs. I heard muffled laughter and what sounded like a group of horses coming up the stairs. As they burst through the bedroom door, yes, I said, they are Lisa and her boss, Rick. Do you know how long 4.75 seconds are? It's like one huge sigh when your eyes meet hers or three heartbeats, but it's enough time to kill the romantic mood and destroy a marriage. It took Lisa's brain 1.5 seconds to register that something had changed. When she ran into our bedroom, her shirt was unbuttoned and her bra had already been removed. Her brain then sent an impulse into her voice box, which took approximately 2.0 seconds for her to utter the words, oh my God, and finally 1.25 seconds for her to realize she was so to speak. If this wasn't the world record for breaking up a marriage, it should have been at least the second. Rick, seeing what was happening, turned around and ran to the front door. It disappeared in less than 45 seconds. I, on the contrary, watched as Lisa began to cry and fell to her knees. I poured the contents of both glasses onto the bed, went to the closet, and started getting dressed, all the while listening to Lisa tell me how sorry she is and how much she loves me. 
It took me about five minutes to get dressed and tell her it was in her best interest for her to leave before I returned. I went downstairs, got into the car, and drove to the nearest place where I could get a drink. So, I'm sitting at Tony's, finishing my fourth beer, wondering what my next step will be. At 6.30, I returned to my now quiet and empty house. The front door was unlocked and Lisa's car was nowhere to be found. After quickly peeing downstairs, I headed to her bedroom. Everything was almost the same as when I left. The garden bath was working, the wine, the chocolate were there untouched. Lisa's closet was open, as were several dresser drawers. I sat on the bed and tried to put my thoughts in order when my cell phone rang. I turned it off without answering because I wasn't in the mood to talk to anyone right now. I know I have to replace the mattress in the guest room, I told myself when I woke up the next morning. I showered, shaved, and went to work, but on the way to my office, I looked more like a zombie. Well, how did it go? All three girls shouted, running into my office. Judging by the way you look, it must have been one hell of a night, Karen giggled, nudging the other two. Oh, that's how it was, I replied, telling them the short version of last night. What are you going to do? Cheryl asked. To survive and take care of my children, I muttered. So, if you don't mind, please keep quiet about it. I don't want to be the laughing stock of the whole office. I told them they left, telling me how sorry they were and that if I needed someone to talk to, they were always there. I thanked them and closed the office door. Bank accounts, credit cards, life insurance policies, 401k, all were closed or changed by 9.30 a.m. I then called my parents and told them that Lisa and I were having some problems and asked if they could keep the kids until the weekend. They were sad to hear about this and were more than happy to watch the children. Checking my cell phone, I found 20 messages from Lisa. I threw them all away. The lawyer gave me the name of a good lawyer at a reasonable price, if possible, and I made an appointment for Friday morning. You'll never truly know how screwed you are until you spend two hours with a divorce lawyer and have him lay out your options or lack thereof. It was your word against hers. Lisa and Rick hadn't done anything yet when you caught them and you couldn't kick her out of the house because it was her house too. You know what really pissed me off? She would most likely get custody of the kids, the house, and at least 40% of what I made after taxes. He suggested marriage counseling or at least a 90-day cooling-off period before I did anything. Look, Keith, no matter what you do, you'll be paying child support for the next eight years at least, plus house payments. The only thing you can do is bide your time and try to minimize your losses. Look, if it were me, I'd move into the spare bedroom and make life at home as easy as possible for your kids, he suggested. I left early and moved all my junk into the spare bedroom. I bought a new mattress and threw the old one to the curb. I never answered Lisa's calls, but I knew that sooner or later, she would most likely show up at the house, so I tried to be ready for the meeting. I picked up the kids on Friday on my way home from work and took them to a pizza place. They told me they had a great time but were glad to go home. Lisa finally showed up around 8.30 that evening. The children surrounded her on all sides, but she never took her eyes off me. By 10, they went to their rooms and I headed to the guest room. Lisa asked if we could talk later, but I told her I wasn't in the mood. Maybe tomorrow, I said, closing and locking the door. I heard a muffled scream as she looked around what used to be our bedroom. I heard sheets being pulled off the bed and other noises as I imagined her trying to tidy up the room. On Saturday morning, I noticed a card, rose petals, and chocolates in the trash bin along with an empty bottle of wine. The children had breakfast and went about their usual Saturday activities, friends and football. I wasn't really hungry, so I just made coffee. Lisa came down just as I was finishing my first cup. I poured myself another, grabbed the newspaper, and went out onto the deck. You know that sooner or later, you'll have to talk to me, she said through red eyes. But why, Lisa? What can you tell me to explain what I saw on Wednesday? How long have you been cheating on me with Rick? It was only the second time, believe me, dear, Lisa sobbed. Why do I have a hard time believing you? And, by the way, you've lost the privilege of calling me honey or anything else that sounds endearing, I spat. We will coexist for the sake of the children until I understand what is best for me and for them. Looks like you've already made your choice, then. Lisa ran into the house and I finished my coffee and tore the newspaper in a rage. Work sucked for the next two weeks, but at least it wasn't as bad as my home life. Someone had spilled the beans at work and now all I was getting were these pitying looks from all the women in my office every time I walked past them.
My boss wanted to know if I needed personal time off, but I told him I was managing it and that I needed a job to keep me sane. The children knew from day one that something was wrong and asked if they had done anything wrong. Children, your mother and I are going through a difficult period, but everything is fine, believe me, I told them. But it was not so. Lisa tried to get me to talk and even tried to seduce me once, but I no longer felt anything for her. I felt worse than whale when Cheryl walked into my office Thursday just before five. Cog your coat, we're leaving, she announced. I looked up to say something, but she stopped me. Maybe you don't understand, this is not a request. Grab your damn coat, we're leaving, she announced. When Cheryl and I arrived at Tony's, two more of the formidable trio, Katie and Karen, were sitting at a table in the corner. After ordering a drink, Cheryl got to work on me. You need to come to your senses, Keith, she began. You've been walking around like dead for the last two weeks, and even though everyone has your back, you're going to be in deep if you don't tie your head and ass together. I have my reasons, so why don't you just off? I almost shouted back at her. Off? You're not talking to Lisa, Karen replied. What the hell do you want, Keith, or are you going to wallow in self-pity for the rest of your life? I want everything to be like it was before this happened, I said, looking at my glass. I thought you said your marriage was stale and you wanted to revive it, Katie asked. Do you really want to go back to your boring life? Do you love her? I love and hate her at the same time. I wish I could strangle her and Rick for what they did to me, I screamed. I just don't know what the hell to do or even where to start. Let's eat and then we'll figure it out, Cheryl said, calling the waiter. The first thing we need to do is level the playing field. Lisa is still in your house and returns to work every day. Rick, on the other hand, goes home to his loving wife and children even though he ruined your marriage, Cheryl spat. It's time for you to get your life back. By the end of the evening, I felt better and they were right. I had to do something. I couldn't let this go on, it tore me apart. Lisa wanted to know where I was when I got home. So what? Do you care about it? I shouted as she went into her bedroom crying. The next day, I met with my lawyer, Randy. I thought you were going to wait for a divorce, he asked. Yes, I want to sue the company that Rick and Lisa work for and then hit Rick with an alienation of love lawsuit, I told him. Look, Keith, you don't have hard evidence. I told you so. I know, but they work for a public company and with all the crap in the news lately about corporate mismanagement, I don't think they'd want bad press. Also, even though Lisa wasn't at work, most managers work until five. Don't most corporate bylaws have a morality clause when a married boss has sex with a married employee he supervises, especially during working hours? Randy said, It would take a couple of days for everything to be finalized and the papers filed, but he would let me know when things got underway. For the next three days, I was the old Keith. I joked with people at work, had fun with the kids, and even started talking to Lisa again, which made her life a little easier. On Thursday, Randy called and said that their company had been served, but I asked him to wait with Rick's papers until we reached an agreement with their company. By the following Tuesday, Randy and I were sitting in a conference room across from the CEO and his manager. We have reviewed the documents, and it appears that you forgot to include any documents about the alleged incident, the manager began. He then said something about frivolous lawsuits and was quite surprised when I stood up and headed out. I guess we'll see you in court, then, I said, getting up from my chair. You know we will take testimony from all office employees, I said calmly. How many of them do you think knew what was going on? All I have to do is find one or two, I told them. How many managers do you think will defend Rick when their asses are on the line? Good luck, gentlemen, I said, walking out with Randy. I was sitting at my desk on Wednesday when Randy called. They want to straighten out or, as they put it, make this mess go away, he told me. Well, I asked for $250,000, attorney fees, and for them both to be transferred to other state offices. That should cover everything, I told him. Tell them the offer is valid until noon Thursday, and then we'll move on. That afternoon, Randy called me again. They agreed to the fees and transfers, but they are offering $150,000, he told me. Randy, stop. Haggling. Tell them the price is now $300,000 and if they come back with another counteroffer, the price will rise to $400,000. Maybe this will end everything. On Thursday at 3.30, Randy called and said that my offer was accepted and by 5, he would give me the forms to sign. True to his word, the package was delivered to my office at 4.30. 
They were waiting for him, the secretary told me after reviewing the papers and the check attached to them. I signed the papers and handed them over. If someone is looking for me, then I'm gone for the whole day, I told her, leaving the office. In the car on the way home, I quickly called Randy. Serve Rick tonight and do it at his house. I was over the moon, by tomorrow I would have a pound of flesh and I could move on with my life. Okay, that's it. Grab your coat because we're going out to dinner tonight, I said, walking through the door. Lisa looked at me and did not move. Come on, Lisa, you too. A wide smile appeared on her face as she ran for her coat. Over dinner, we talked and laughed as we had done for the past 12 years. Life was good again, almost good. When we got home, everyone thanked me for a great evening and went to their rooms. Lisa came closer, kissed me on the cheek, and thanked me for the evening. It meant a lot to me tonight, she said. I told her that we would have a nice long talk tomorrow night, so she needed to get some sleep. You son of a Lisa shouted, entering the door. You knew last night what would happen today, didn't you? Not quite, Lisa, but pretty close, I answered. Where's the job that you were offered? Tenafly, New Jersey, wherever the hell that is. It seemed like my services were no longer needed here and it was either New Jersey or I was out of work, she explained. I told them there was no way they would transfer me there and then they gave me severance pay and gave me 20 minutes to clean the table. She sobbed. I gave them eight years and in 20 minutes I was out the door, she said, sitting on a kitchen chair and sobbing. Where's your friend and Rick being transferred? I asked. Flint, Michigan, she said, staring at the floor. The armpit of the Northeast. This couldn't have happened to a nicer guy, I said, grinning from ear to ear. Well, Lisa, this is how the next phase will go, I said, pulling up my chair. If you want to be part of this family, here are the conditions. First of all, you need to be examined for sexually transmitted diseases and bring me a certificate of health. Then you will take a polygraph test and to help you, I will even ask all the questions in advance, I said, holding the paper across the table. As you can see, they start out very easy but become increasingly difficult down the list. By the time she got to the last group, she started crying. Am I the biological father of my two children? Why did she cheat when we had sex in the last couple of months? Who were you thinking about, Rick or me? How often have you lied to me in the last couple of months? How many affairs have you had? Do you still love me? You have a meeting tomorrow at 9, I said. And if you get through this without any major surprises, we have an appointment with a marriage counselor for Saturday morning at 10. Lisa just sat and cried, going through questions. I can answer them now if you want, she said. I think I'll wait until tomorrow, I told her. I just don't trust you anymore and I want to start all over again without any lies, if you don't mind. I didn't like all her answers, but in my mind, she passed. Do I trust her? Hell no. Do I plan to stay with her? Well, the jury is still out, but we're working on it. The worst part is that we haven't made love for the last five months, and that's what I really miss. We have sex once or twice a week to relieve tension, so to speak, but it's not the same thing. Rick took a transfer to Flint, Michigan, last year. I sent him a Christmas card from Florida that said, glad you're not here. Oh, by the way, his wife and children are here. I think the sunny south won over the cheating husband. Go figure it out. Thank you for listening to this story. Now here is another exciting story for you to read. I was watching TV when I heard the doorbell ring. I got up, went to the door, and looked through the peephole. Crap, I wondered how the hell she managed to find me. I considered just going back to the TV and ignoring the doorbell, but then I decided that if she had put so much effort into finding me, she wouldn't leave until she got what she came for. I connected the chain and then opened the door just enough so that we could see each other and said, What the hell do you want? Talk to you? Didn't my leaving tell you that I have no interest in ever seeing you again, let alone talking to you? I have no idea why you left. I came home and you were already gone. No, no, just all your stuff gone. Nonsense. How could you not know why? You heard me when I told you what would happen if you walked out the door. Can I come in? I decided that I had better get this over with, unclasped the chain, stepped aside, and she came in. She sat down on the sofa and asked me for a glass of water. As I followed her, my thoughts went back to the night that started it all. I had just got home from work and found my wife, Alice, getting dressed up. I didn't know we had plans for a date, not with us. I have a date today. Date with whom? You do not know him. He's the guy I work with. He's new to the office and doesn't know many people yet. 
He wanted to go to Sylvia's birthday party, but he didn't want to go alone, so he asked me to go with him. He knows you're married, doesn't he? It does not matter. Nothing will happen between us. Besides, I also don't want to go to Sylvia's party alone and you won't go with me. So, I told him I'll go with him. And you know why I won't go. I can't stand being around that in round heels and I don't want you to have anything to do with her. Get used to it, Sam. She's been my best friend since first grade and I won't turn my back on her just because you don't like her. I don't like her because she got divorced four times and each time it was because she was caught cheating on her husband. And I don't like going to her parties because of all the illegal drugs she has. So, you think that just because she cheated, I will too? Just because I'm close to her? I think this is very likely. Just look at yourself now. You're in your take-me outfit, a little black dress, getting ready for a date with another man. Obviously dressed for him and I can only think of one reason to dress so sexy for him. It's disgusting what you say. No, that's not true. What did you wear to the last two parties at Sylvia's? I'll tell you in case you forgot. Once there were trousers and a blouse, another time jeans and a sweater. There is no doubt in my mind why you are dressed this way for this party. Sylvia finally convinced you to try someone else. From the snippets of conversations I overheard, I know that she's been trying to get you to join her little orgies for years. I think she finally got what she was looking for. You're wrong. It's not like that at all. It's easy enough to prove that I'm wrong. Don't go. Stay here with me. I can't. Todd is counting on me and he is more important to you than me. All I can tell Alice is that if you leave, you will kiss your marriage goodbye. Don't be funny. It won't hurt us at all. Don't wait for me, she said, heading towards the door. Goodbye, Alice, I said as she walked out the door. I think she heard the finality in the way I said it and she hesitated for a second or two and then walked away. Did I overreact? I don't think so. I was good friends with many of the guys in Sylvia's circle and from them, I learned everything about what happened at Sylvia's parties. After people who didn't want to participate left, the parties turned into orgies. I figured that even though Alice wasn't taking part, she was still around and watching. I also heard Sylvia say to Alice, forget about him, you're married to him. Join in, you know you want to. And that Alice always answered that yes, she wanted to, but she wouldn't because I didn't join. My joining could never happen. I spent countless hours trying to get Alice to break up with Sylvia and stop going to her parties, but I could never get it done because of her relationship with her best friend. I spent a good part of the evening wondering what I should do. I was thinking about divorce, but I really didn't know if Alice would cheat. But could I live with her given her you, Sam, I'm leaving attitude? I had what I thought were seven wonderful years with her. The only bad thing was that she was always hanging out with Sylvia, who I just couldn't stand. She was trash as far as I was concerned, and Alice knew my attitude. The ringing of the bedside phone woke me up, and when I sat up, I saw the time on the alarm clock and wondered who would call me at one in the morning. Hello? Hey, idiot. Did I wake you up? What do you want, Sylvia? I'm just calling to let you know that your wife has finally found a real man. What the hell are you talking about? Just what I said. Alice found herself a real man, a man who can give her what she really needs. Now just listen. And I heard the sounds of people having sex, and then I heard, Oh God, yes. Take me, please. Take me harder. The voice was my wife's. I hung up. Thirty seconds later, the phone rang again, and I knew who. It would be, so I picked it up and dropped it on the floor. One of the benefits of living in an apartment is that you don't accumulate a lot of stuff because you have nowhere to put it. I had everything I wanted packed and out of the truck in just over an hour. I was at the motel by 3 and at the bank by 9 o'clock when the doors opened. I cleared all the accounts and then went to my job and told Jake I was quitting without notice and why. He said he understood, wrote me a final check, helped me load the tools, said he could give me recommendations, and wished me well. My phone has been ringing since 7 o'clock and all the calls were from Alice. Finally, I turned it off and made a mental note to get a new number. Then I changed my mind. I didn't know if Alice would be able to get a new number from our cell phone provider or not. I decided to throw the phone in the trash and buy a track phone from Walmart. I didn't have to do anything with credit cards since Alice and I didn't have any cards together. She had two in her name and I had three in mine. By 10 o'clock, I was already on my way to a destination that I had not yet determined. 
All I knew was that it had to be miles away from Alice. I finally landed in Castle Rock, Colorado. I found a job in my field and settled down to start a new life. If there was a divorce, she would know where I am. In a year, she could use the refusal as a reason. The only downside to this is that I would never find out about the divorce, but that didn't really matter back then because I had no plans to ever get married again. The next two years passed and life was good. I dated some women and had a friend with benefits and now this. You heard me when I told you what would happen if you went on this date. You ignored me, went on that date, and I did what I said I was going to do. How did you find me? A very expensive private detective. Why do you need this? You are my husband. How did you find the money to pay a very expensive private detective with your secretary's salary? I sold the house. Which house? The one I received in court I started to ask but caught myself. It just didn't matter. Well, you wasted your money and the time it took you to get here because we're done. You did exactly what I knew you were going to do when you left me to go to that party. And don't bother wasting your time trying to tell me nothing happened. Your best friend called me at 1 o'clock in the morning and then held the phone so that I could listen to what was happening. Your, oh God, yes, take me, please, take me harder, came loud and clear and said it all. She made it. I probably should have gotten back at her harder than I did. I think I need to tell you what happened since you weren't there to see or hear about it. I did not go to that party to get screwed. This was the farthest thing from my thoughts. Yes, I changed for the party, but Sylvia asked me to. For some reason, she didn't like Todd or so she said. But she couldn't tell him not to come to the party because it was an open invitation to everyone in the office. She asked me to dress sexy and let him think he was lucky. I like to dress up and that's what I did. Todd actually took one look at me and thought he was going to hit the jackpot that night. He stuck to me as if glued, almost as if I was afraid that if he wasn't there, someone else might get to me. It was a fun party and although Todd was hanging around, I think the other guys thought I looked hot that night and I was dancing with a few guys. As soon as the party ended, my head started spinning and swimming. Sylvia told me that I had drunk too much that night and she put me to bed in one of her spare bedrooms. I don't know how or when it started, but I gradually realized that they were making love to me. I thought I was home in bed with you until I heard someone say, hurry up, okay, I'm next. I looked around and saw Sylvia on the bed next to me. Todd and Ben Grady. I saw several other guys standing around naked. One of them was obviously going to be next. You know me, Sam. You know how I feel when we make love. I get lost, I become a sex machine. I don't know how many of them did this to me before I passed out. The next morning, I woke up next to Bob Flanagan. He lay leaning on his elbow and looked at me. I saw the expression on his face and asked what. I just never thought you'd cheat on Sam. Glad you did it, though. I hope to see you again. But I slapped him on the cheek, got dressed, and went to the hospital. They tested me and found traces of rohypnol and ecstasy in my blood and then called the police. While I was waiting for the police, I tried to call you, but I didn't get an answer. I realized why I couldn't contact you when I returned home and found you gone. When the police talked to me, I told them everything I knew and what little I remembered. The first person they talked to was Flanagan and he told them he had no idea I was drugged and high and he didn't think about taking me. But that's what always happened at Sylvia's parties and I knew it and had even stood up before, nearby, and watched. He said that he decided that I had finally decided to try. He told them the names of all the guys he knew who had sex with me that night. The police thought Todd must have been part of what happened to me that night and when they got on him he rolled over and told them it was all Sylvia's doing. She knew I was hesitant about joining so she decided to push me. She decided that once the illicit drug wore off I would still continue and I would enjoy it and want to do it again. She was right about that, I really liked it. But here's where she screwed up. She didn't pay any attention to the fact that I told her over and over again that I wouldn't join without you. You had to agree to this, otherwise I wouldn't have done it. As soon as I was done with the hospital and the police, the policeman took me home and I realized why I couldn't call you. I broke down and cried for two days and then I called a lawyer and filed a lawsuit against everyone who was at that party and who offended me. Most of the lawsuits were thrown out because they all said the same thing Flanagan said, but the lawsuits against Sylvia and Todd were valid because the two of them conspired against me. I won my claims, but Sylvia had nothing but her house. So they asked me if I would agree to it. She owed $30,000 on it, but with what I got from Todd, I was able to pay it off and then I sold it.
As soon as I had money from selling the house, I hired a private investigator, and here I am. And you spent your money on a private detective and the time it took you to get here. For what? So that we can be together again? I love you and belong to you. You would be smarter to spend your money on a lawyer to get a divorce. You could use abandonment as a basis. I don't want a divorce, Sam. What you want or don't want doesn't matter to me anymore, Alice. I didn't do it of my own free will, Sam. I was drugged, I was high. But you walked out the door willingly even though I told you that if you walked out that door, you would kiss your marriage goodbye. Well, you ignored what I said and walked out again. The way I left should have told you that you wasted your time and money to get here. I have to be here if I want us to be together again. You're not paying attention to what I'm saying now about what you did that evening when you left me. Pay attention, Alice. I don't want you. You can't bring us back together again because I don't want to. I mean, I don't want to date again a woman who can do what you did. Damn it, Sam, can't you understand that I didn't do this of my own free will? It's you who don't understand anything, Alice. This is not what happened with Sylvia, although I expected it to happen and I warned that it might happen. That's what you did the moment you walked out the door to go see Sylvia. It was complete disrespect for me that you showed before leaving on a date. Don't be funny, Sam. It won't hurt us at all. As you walked out the door to go on a date with another man, killed any us there might have been. Now please go away. I need to get ready for dinner. I'm hungry. I'll eat with you and we can talk. I'm going to convince you that you're wrong, that we can put it all together. Her words didn't have time to die down when the front door opened and an extremely beautiful blonde walked in, shouting, I'm home, baby. What's for dinner? Then she saw Alice and asked, Who is this? This is Alice. You've heard me talk about her once or twice. Alice, this is Beverly. Beverly surprised Alice when she walked up to her, leaned over, hugged her, and said, Thank you for sending Sam to me, and then turned to me and asked, What's for dinner? I think we'll go somewhere. I made a reservation with Angelo. I'll go change. Nice to meet you, Alice. Maybe we can get together sometime and compare experiences. And then she headed to the bedroom. You need to leave now, Alice. I need to change for dinner. Does she know that you are married? She knows. You need to let her know that I will fight for you, Sam. Wake up, Alice. For you to fight for me, you would need to spend time with me and that just won't happen. Get a divorce and find yourself another man. And when you find him, don't put the crap on him that you brought on me. Tears were streaming down her cheeks as she said, Damn it, Sam, why can't you understand that I didn't cheat on you? I was high against my will. So what? In order for you to be pumped full of drugs, you had to be there, and that's the whole point. I told you not to go. I told you when you opened the door to leave that if you left, you would kiss your marriage goodbye. You ignored me. You left. The marriage is over. It's that simple. Now please go away. I need to get ready for a dinner date. I'm not going to divorce you, Sam, and you should tell your girlfriend about this. She can never marry you. She can't marry me anyway. She is already married and in the same boat as me. Her husband won't give her a divorce and she won't spend money trying to get one. I'll go, but I won't go far. I can't bring you back from a long distance, so I'm moving here. I'm going to take you back. Nonsense, Alice. I've already said this several times and you need to get it into your head that I'm serious. I do not want you. Now go. She cried but left. Bev walked into the room and she looked radiant. Why aren't you ready? I decided not to go. No, it just took me longer to get rid of it than I thought. Is she gone forever? It must be. I made it clear to her that I wanted nothing to do with her. That's good because I'm not going to let you get away from me. I smiled at this and said, 10 minutes and I'll be ready. Dear viewers, thank you for staying with us and supporting our channel. See you again.